Hi, welcome to the Capital Forum 7th Annual Antitrust Thought Leaders Interview Series. My name is Connor Winters and I am joined today by Laura Collins. Laura is a senior associate uh, with Freshfields based out of the Washington DC office. Uh, Laura recently uh, spent some time in Brussels uh, with Freshfields. Uh, prior to joining Freshfields, she was a trial attorney with the US Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. Uh, Laura, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, Connor. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Yeah, so I want to start with your recent experience in mm -hmm. Brussels. Coming from the U.S., the DOJ, uh, what are some differences in merger review procedure between the two ju jurisdictions that sort of stand out to you as worth sort of thinking about more? I mean, there's a lot that's the same on substance, but on procedure, the two can be really different. I mean, it starts off with a question of where does a merger need to be filed, um, which can be a little more scattered in Europe. Um, what needs to go into the initial filings, how the agencies interact with the parties, what the statutory timelines are, what the different um, authorities need to give to the parties along the way, and ultimately what they need to put into a decision or, or not put into a decision at all. Are there any uh, specific types of uh, differences, uh, procedures that uh, maybe serve as an example? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, Taking the first point, you know, where right. a merger is filed in the first place, it's pretty straightforward in the U.S. You know, we've got a national, federal test for HSR, and if you meet it, you file with the FTC and DOJ. If uh, you don't, then you don't have to. Although the agencies can still review your transaction. Um, in Europe, there are two different thresholds for. Um, whether there needs to be something filed at the European Commission, but then each of the member states has their own test. And these right. tests can be very different. So the European Commission has a turnover test, but the different member states will have um, tests based on turnover or transaction value, which is what we have here, or even market shares, which I find to be very odd coming from the US, where that's a very highly factual question that comes into play a little later in the process. but. You know whether a merger is filed or not goes into whether the agencies will probably look at it or not, mm -hmm. and uh, you know going from there, there are a lot more <laughs> differences um, about what goes into the filing, and I can go into that as well. Or for sure, yeah. Would you like to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, um, yeah. So the filings themselves um, have different points. I mean, part of it that you have to recognize is I think there are about 2,000 HSR filings that come through every year, opposed to closer to 300 European Commission filings. So you're dealing with a different volume, and they're trying to capture different things. So in the HSR filing, you've got some corporate information, and then the party's internal documents vary. Cut, fault, straight and dry, uh, very cut and dry and straightforward, <laughs> and uh, they uh, give the agencies a chance to look at just facts, whereas the European Commission filing includes a lot of advocacy. The parties need to provide market shares and data, describe all the overlaps in detail. They provide a lot more narrative information that you'd normally get in something more like a second request in the U.S. Okay, so I, I know you know we could go through a lot of different examples mm -hmm. in that much detail and more. <laughs> right. Uh, but I guess to sort of back it out a little bit, mm -hmm. how did differences in procedure between the U.S. and EU, whether it's the filing procedures uh, or anything else, how did those sort of shape enforcement actions, enforcement decisions in the EU versus the United States? Well, so there are a lot of different things that play into timing, and when you're dealing with a transaction, timing is always very right. important. You've got to try to keep things on track so you can close before um, your long stop date. Um, and so the parties will be doing different things to try to keep the transaction moving along. In the U.S., that's often putting in um, information only if you're asked questions by the DOJ or the FTC and trying to knock the questions out as quickly as possible in the first 30 or 60 days before getting into a second request period, which puts you into a completely different timing ball game. And most transactions can get through the US fairly quickly. Either they don't get any questions or they just move through. Um, in the EU, the process is much slower to start out because they have those long filings that require so much information. There's a lot of interaction with the agencies, even when there isn't um, a necessarily a competitive issue. If you've got any sort of overlap, you have to provide a lot of information. And they have to ask a lot of questions about it. Um, 
and that leads to a longer process up front and in some cases it means that you get on their timing schedule which um, you know is 25 working days once you manage to get your filing in. That period before you can get your filing in the first place can take a really long time. And so there's a question at the end of that first phase, do you submit remedies at that point or not right. before going into their second phase and trying to fight it out like we would in a second request? And that can lead to some more remedies sort of upfront um, or in earlier phases just to get through the timing to get your deal completed. Okay. So I, I know, you know in the U.S., and mm -hmm. obviously having been a trial attorney, you're yeah. well aware that uh, one of the considerations uh, people talk about for what in, uh, shapes which cases are brought is sort of the likelihood of success in court. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about the differences between the EC and the and the DOJ, the FTC, sort of on that end of how you actually go about uh, either seeking to enjoin a merger or have that consideration of should we bring this action? Sure. I mean, so in the in the U.S., there are different procedures that I'm sure most folks watching are aware of. Um, but at both the DOJ and the FTC, if they want to stop a merger from consummating in the first place, they both sort of need to go into court before an Article III judge to get a preliminary injunction, even though they'll have slightly different trial paths going down the line. Um, that is not the case in Europe. It's done internally through the commission. There's a process over there, but it's sort of within the administrative body to the decision point, but there are opportunities for appeal. And one of the biggest differences, um, and which actually shapes a lot of the reasons the filings can be so complicated, is that um, the parties can appeal a decision, but so can interested third parties. And then they essentially sue the commission uh, before the European uh, General Court um, on both the facts and the law. and. Um, the, the commission has to respond to that so that they don't have a choice as to whether they're going into litigation or not really, the way the DOJ and the FTC do. They can put more out there in terms of trying to get um, a settlement or get something blocked before going through the court procedure, but that possibility is lurking in the background. So on that initial decision, mm -hmm. does, that, does the difference uh, change the kind of the kinds of advice that you give to clients in terms of how to approach remedy talks or sort of anything along the way, knowing that in the U.S. there's that first step of having to go to court to even get the, the sort of, I guess, initial decision, uh, whereas in the EU uh, you don't necessarily have to go through that and the burden almost rests on the parties to appeal, like you're saying. Yeah, so uh, most cases it doesn't come into play. Most okay. of the cases that you'll, anyone did, is advising on probably won't get to a stage where litigation is a question um, because most cases don't get challenged or, or have decrees. So in those cases, and even some of the trickier cases, you're mostly engaging with staff. And staff in, on both sides of the Atlantic are highly experienced in this area. They have ec economists helping out the attorneys. Um, and so to the extent you have good arguments at a staff level, that's not really going to change very much. Um, the question then is when you have the really tricky cases and you don't know whether or not um, you'd be able to win before a judge and, and sometimes it depends on which judge you'd get. So in those cases in the U.S., it, when you're thinking about the set of facts in front of you, um, and you're talking to staff and folks at um, the division at the FTC about what you're doing, there's sort of a question mark at the end, who, who is the final person who will be thinking about this? Whereas at the commission, you have a much better sense sort of all the way going through the, the leanings and inclinations of the folks who will be making that pre-litigation decision um, about blocking or um, requiring a divestiture. So taking a step back, and throughout all the differences in the process from pre-notification talks to uh, to litigate, you know, to the actual filing and then to the possibility of litigation or a remedy, uh, how, what does that set of differences mean for cross-Atlantic cooperation and multi-jurisdictional deals? And if a deal has to be notified in both the U.S. and the EU or um, multi you know, even more jurisdictions, how does that sort of shape uh, cooperation between the agencies? So the agencies, 
definitely cooperate. They ask for waivers in al almost all the cases where they're interested and they're both taking a look at them. Um, and then there's a question of timeline. As I mentioned before, um, the European Commission process can take a lot longer to get to even a filing. So it's very possible for you to already be in a second request in the US and your official filing still hasn't gone in in the EU because there have been a lot of pre-notification questions and once they start with phase one they've got that 25 working day clock before going in before making a decision about whether they extend it or not um, and so sometimes they're not completely aligned with their timing but when you know that they're going to be talking to each other if you think there's going to be a remedy that might cross uh, the Atlantic or you know around the world the parties will work um, up front to sort of pace out what that schedule might be and we'll be thinking about the fact that the agencies will be coordinating and talking with each other. So there, there are sometimes some decisions to make about whether you hold off on making certain filings until other jurisdictions are at a particular point. Um, and a lot of that's case specific. It depends what the companies are, where the issues are. Sometimes there are issues that are concentrated in one place or the other. Sometimes they'll be not in the US or Europe, but somewhere entirely different and just trying to figure out where the issues are, um, how the different authorities will want to engage and when they'll want to be talking to each other because some authorities will wait for leadership from another authority. They'll defer to them because, or maybe not defer, but they'll take their thoughts into consideration because the matter means more in the other jurisdiction. Uh, Chairman Joseph Simons mm -hmm. at the Federal Trade Commission and lots of other observers have talked recently about uh, the importance of consensus in an approach to antitrust law from an enforcement standpoint. Uh, what is your sort of takeaway, I guess, from, from your time in Europe about that question of consensus in Europe? Obviously, you have 20-some you know, countries yeah. now, uh, lots of political factions you have to manage. How, how does the uh, European uh, Commission approach that question? Um, so... As I mentioned before, you know, you've got a, a staff that's trained to do antitrust review and you know, on a day-to-day -day level that might not come into play. What you do see a lot of, um, particularly right now in the wake of the siemens alstom uh, decision, is some jurisdictions are calling for different political considerations um, in merger review. Um, politicians in France and Germany have spoken up saying that they're interested in making some changes to allow for European champions to be able to compete on a global scale with Chinese champions and uh, other other large global companies um, even when that might cut against some of the the more local uh, competition analysis that more traditionally is going on right now. So there definitely are, there's a political conversation uh, over in Europe, just like there's a conversation over here about what the factors should be um, in a merger analysis. Okay. Uh, and one thing I wanted to ask you about was mm -hmm. sort of, we've talked a lot about merger review uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, but there have been a lot of recent uh, high-profile instances of conduct cases mm -hmm. um, brought by the EC, the, the Google fine uh, last week in particular stands out, and uh, a lot of people in our debate on uh, the side of the U.S. sort of point to that divide uh, as being more evidence of you know, the European Union being maybe more active or having a, being in the eyes of some critics more effective in their enforcement regime. Are there structural reasons that account for those sorts of differences, or is that more of just about political will and political climate? I mean, some of it's law in the first right. place, right? So in Europe. There, there's case law that says com dominant companies have um, a sort of heightened responsibility to take certain or not take certain actions that would abuse their dominant position. Um, and the case law over here it has a slightly different standard. So in those senses, it's almost easier um, under the, the law that they have set up in Europe to bring um, some of those cases. And some of that goes hand in hand with what the political will was back when those laws were written and when initial cases were enforced. But there, there's a lot of convergence, uh, but there, I think there's still a little bit of a gap between the way even the law is set up and uh, across the two jurisdictions. Awesome. Uh, Laura, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Connor Winters.
Uh, thanks for joining us.